Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We're still letting people in, so we'll start in a couple of minutes. So I hope you're all well. And like I say, thanks for joining us today for our Delivering Greener event session. Hello and welcome to those who've just joined. We'll wait until about a minute after half past before we make a start, just to allow a few more people to join. But thank you very much for joining us. Nice to see you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We'll make a start, there's a few more people coming to join I think, but keen to press on and be um, underway on time. I'm Hayley, I'm the Head of Communications at New Anglia LEP. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the fifth of our Clean Growth Business webinars. Great to see some familiar faces and absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much to the University of Suffolk students for joining us, I see you all in your classroom, it's quite exciting. So thanks so much for tuning in. Um, Today's session is all about delivering greener events, which is hopefully something you're all interested in. And we have three speakers joining us today. And I have, I think, just seen Jenny join. So Genevieve will be joining us in a little bit. Genevieve is from the First Light Festival. She's actually with some real life actual visitors in Lowestoft at the moment, and will be joining us in about 10 or 15 minutes for, um, for her piece. So in the meantime, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Jess Smith from Old Food and Drink Festival and Jenny Cousins from the Museum of East Anglian Life. I'll hand over to them both to introduce themselves and then we'll get underway. Throughout the session today, if you have any questions or anything you'd like to add, please do add it into the chat feature, just type it in and we'll pick up questions in a little while. So Jess, if you'd like to introduce yourself first. Hi Jess. Hello everyone. So um, I'm Jess. I've been organising the Old Brook Food and Drink Festival for the last eight years and working on it for 10 in total. Um, and I'm sure lots of you know the event already. It's a food and drink festival and it's all about um, supporting the local food and drink economy um, and putting the area kind of on the map as a food and drink destination. So uh, lots of that obviously incorporates some of the sustainability and the things that a part of events. Um, yeah, so hopefully I can help answer some questions and, and give you a bit of an insight into the event and how we organise things there. Fantastic. Thank you, Jess. And 
Jenny Cousins, be seeing if he's standing in knife. I believe you're with us, Jenny. I Hi can't there. see one Hi. between. Hi, Jenny. Nice to see you. I'll move through your slides as well for you, Jenny, if you just let me know when you want me to move on. Um, great. Are you doing that now or? Yeah, great. Yeah, should be able to see them. Thank you. So um, I took over at the Museum of East Anglian Life um, five years ago, um, and I just thought it was worth um, saying just a little bit about us and um, the kind of context in which we're running events and doing activities. Um, so the museum, it's a 75 acre site. Um, this is the sort of visitor map. It just shows sort of part of the site. So if you go on to the next one. Um, it's it, what you've been sort of looking at is the bit that's round at the top. Um, but why I wanted to sort of show you this is that the context in which we operate is right in the centre of town. So that's always something to be thinking about in terms of how we're, we're doing events. Next slide. Um, the museum is a museum of historic buildings. So a lot of things that have either been brought to site and then recreated on site or things that were always here like Abbots Hall. Um, next one. Um, we also grow um, a lot. So this is our walled garden. Next one. Go back. Um, and there's also the whole sort of um, like natural side of what we do. So this is one of our river otters caught on a trail cam. Um, and I would say that, you know, all three elements, the historic buildings, the natural environment and the kind of um, managed human agricultural environment are a, a part of our work and need to always be taken into account whenever we're sort of planning events. So next one. Um, there's also the kind of context in which we operate. So um, as an organization, we employ about 25 people, basically 14 full-time equivalents. Um, but we also work with like a huge range of volunteers in the UK and um, beyond as part of our digital volunteering initiative, which we've been running pre-COVID. So for quite a while, um, but that really grew during COVID. We also run a lot of kind of um, workplace schemes. So on the right, you see some of our um, Kickstarters um, who are under 24 year olds who are with us for six months replacements. And we've got at the moment, I think we had tw we've got 29 of them. So more than we've got staff. Um, Next slide, please. Um, and that's important, by the way, just because, you know, events require people and anything you're trying to do requires people. So um, the, that's where we're kind of drawing our people from usually. So the sorts of events we tend to run, the sort of things you might think we do. So we've got our steam engines um, and we've got the kind of historic side of our event program. Next slide, please. Um, there's the kind of community and town sort of side of our um, events. So here's Bonfire Night. Um, that's about usually 5,000 people on and off the site within two hours for fireworks and for a large bonfire. Um, next slide, please. Um, but then there's also things like uh, the Prima Donna Festival, um, which is a literary festival which sort of seeks to um, give prominence to um, voices that are perhaps not so well heard in publishing. Um, and um, this is one of the panel discussions from this summer. Um, so running a kind of COVID event um, where people camp. And then there's also our kind of whole um, commercial events program. So the wedding side, um, and this is um, taken on the back lawn outside uh, where we run um, using the marquee, but also using our medieval barn, using our medieval farmhouse. So lots of different spaces also end up in use for that side please and the other thing that it's um i think worth saying in the context of understanding the museum is that we're in the process of rebranding um we will be rebranding in um march next year as the food museum um which i could talk about more but i won't um in the context of this introduction um but um next slide um we've done various things over the past few years to sort of position ourselves like that restoring um the windmill restoring we're in the process of restoring the watermill at the moment we have a big exhibition that's launching next summer on hedgerow um and we planted a new orchard new animal areas lots of other bits and pieces um but i suppose it colors our events program too and you know the hedgerow is a good example of like how we've interpreted the food theme it's not just a sort of chefy approach and it's not just a farming approach we've tried to look at environmental impact in the way that we're talking about the content that the museum has so that's basically us and me fantastic thank you very much Grace. that's a really useful um introduction i'm going to stop 
sharing because then you'll be able to see everything much more clearly, hopefully. So hi, everyone. Um, so as a starter question, I suppose, Jeff, to you both, Jess and Jenny, is why should organisations start to think about their events and the things they put together as events as part of their sustainability work? I mean, people are much more familiar with, I suppose, travel, transport, energy, um, plastics, things like that. But why events? What sort of impact might they be having and why is it important? Do you want to go or should I? I, I don't mind, you go ahead if you want, Jenny. <laughs> Um, I mean, I suppose the short answer is that we should be thinking about it in everything, shouldn't we really? So like events are no exception. It's got to be part of your overall, you know, so it's no good if you're spending all your time recycling and then it comes to event days and you sort of give up. Um, it, it's, it's a massive logistical headache trying to think about how events work with sustainability, partly because, you know, and this is maybe a bit of an elephant in the room as somebody who's sort of in visitor attractions but part of the problem here is the audience um they come um at the point where you know they're on like holiday and it's uh, if they're visiting a visitor attraction anyway they're in holiday mode but they're in <coughs> excuse me they're in extra holiday mode when it comes to an event um and some of the kind of responsibility sort of flies out of the room i think and it's really difficult i mean i, I don't know jess if you can relate to this but trying to get people to recycle uh, events is like a nightmare like it's a total nightmare so um beyond all the other things that you're trying to do with energy consumption with what you're actually putting out there in the first place you're actually in an environment which doesn't really um sort of support a, a a particularly green approach to things quite a lot of the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is like everything, isn't it? Is um, I know that we always say in the events world is that everything's easy until you have people. And I, and I think that kind of works across the board. But um, I think probably as an event, it's your responsibility to take that away from people, to limit those chances. Um, so, you know, Jenny's talking about that recycle you know we all think about sustainability it's always about recycling um and i think that there are ways to do that um and probably something we might pick up on later is how you do that in the way that to make the most of it so you know you're not putting too much responsibility on the individual i think it's completely different in a workplace to ask people to recycle because they're responsible um once that they're at an event and they're enjoying themselves you know, those things do go out the window, but I think really as an event, sustainability kind of, it, it's like everything, you know, once you break it down, there's so many elements that you operate to put your event together, you know, it's like a jigsaw. So if you take each part and you look at that individually, it's not quite so daunting. So if you strip it back and kind of think, you know, if I was starting an event from the beginning and it was the first thing I was doing, that might be the core of every piece of the jigsaw is kind of thinking, all right, so what sustainability, I think, and it's not always possible. Um, but if you're thinking about it, you're kind of halfway there. I think I think that's a big part of it, really. Yeah, that's great. And that's absolutely right. It's a big sort of education piece, and like you say, trying to make it as simple as simple as possible. Um, so I suppose if we start with looking at venues, either if you are an events venue or can be an events venue, or people looking to hire um, an events venue, what kind of physical things or, or options might people have, you know, like, like for yourself, Jenny, when you're, you know, a, a venue for people's weddings, for example, are there sort of things like that? Or what could people look for in a venue if they're trying to hire one that helps some of this? It doesn't come up very often, I have to say, like not not in the kind of dialogue that we have with um, people over weddings. And um, I wonder whether that will change. But I mean, it certainly does in all of the kind of events that we organise and all the partnerships that we have. It's definitely an element. But I would say it's less an element when it's about a couple and them booking a wedding venue. Um, we have it with the suppliers that people use. I mean, I, I don't want to sort of obsess over recycling because, you know, it's just pointed out it's one part of like an overall um, strategy to do with how you make events more sustainable and how you kind of 
you know, from, from our context, it's definitely to do with the way that we generate energy on site, which we do. It's to do with the way we manage our animals. It's to do with lots of different other things as well. Um, but I, I wouldn't say it's coming up very often um, in that kind of um, discussion with people who are booking. Um, I would say some of that stuff as well is about us leading the way, I guess, you know, so um, it's very different for me or what I've been doing for the last 10 years is because we are an event at a venue um, and that venue happens to already be thinking about lots of those things. So it's very helpful, you know, it makes life a lot easier when we're looking at our sustainability and our footprint. Um, so from that point of view, I think that... Um, it is really important. I think it's going to be in, important in the future um, because these things are becoming more important in general. You know, the, the younger generation who will be those next people that will be getting married or that will be have, having parties and um, hosting events. I think those things will start to become, you know, credentials that they will look for. So um, I, th I think that it's probably something we need to start thinking about the future and how that works and luckily as, as a an event in an established venue you know we've got lots of those things in place but I definitely think it's a future it's a future thing that, that's going to come into into play um, and if you're a new venue you know that's definitely what people are going to be looking at um, if you're establishing yourself as a new reading venue or location I think it can depend quite a lot on like um, on how you're a venue. Like so, for example, for weddings for us, we're a dry high event, higher venue. So beyond recycling and energy use at those events, that's really what we have control over, not the choices that people necessarily make. We do ban certain things. Like for example, we won't we won't let people use any non-organic confetti um, on the site. So there's there are certain things like that that we try and do, um, but it from observing the way that a lot of I mean, weddings they're usually one-off events um that people spend a lot of money on and and sort of often demand the new um it's it's not often that you see a kind of couple coming in with a really um interested bent where they've you know used a wedding dress that somebody else has used before it's 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 quite a disposable culture event i'd say which is an interesting thing to kind of deal with because um, brides are not known for their flexibility over what they want um, and it would be an interesting conversation to have with some of them about you know have you thought about your own choices in this I mean we're um, what we might do as a venue ourselves for the events that we are putting on as an event organizer and what people choose to do in that kind of context is quite different and that's really and interesting though, yeah. dialogue and I think that you're, you're right that the event culture um, or the events industry is um, quite throwaway because things are, you know, like a wedding, it happens for a day, um, the same festival, it might be one day, it might be a long weekend. Um, and those things, those events kind of go and take over a venue and they're there, mm. but it, it hasn't got that longevity um, as if it's a business that's trying to run and operate and thinking about um, all of those things and probably you haven't got the same um, that side of you know if you if you're a business and you're not running sustainably there might be consequences to that and I think within the events industry there isn't that in place so there isn't you're not forced to do something mm. um, and maybe those things will gradually change uh, but it is very throwaway you know it's instant. I, I agree with that and I think that um, I, I would say that there is a tone I mean I'm not in in the events industry in the way you are Jess but like it, there is a there's a tone of discussion at least asking some questions which a few years ago weren't asked I mean I remember once being on this sort of funding panel for a discussion about like a one-off evening event for um it was like 10,000 light bulbs and I asked the question at that is this a good use of 10,000 light bulbs? And, and I just remember the looks from everybody else around the table, like, you know, you could question art in that sort of sense. But I think that if we were having that discussion now, like it's the debate has moved on and that would now be 
like a, an actual deciding factor in whether to support something in the way that I don't think it was a few years ago. But, you know, but just interested in from your kind of perspective, because you've obviously been running an event for several years. Um, and therefore, you know, even though it's it's temporary in the sense that it's there for a week and then it's not there, but then it's there for a week again, you know, you must be making some um it's some of the infrastructure reappears in exactly the same way year after year and presumably you've got all of that kind of set up and therefore the life cycle of your event is really over years rather than just one year yeah definitely i mean and, and i think that when we're doing things and you know even when we were doing things the festival's been going for 16 years so i've been involved for 10 but even then we we're looking at, you know, the, the simple things like packaging, you know, that such, and we, it was, and I think some of it depends on how those events evolve, um, you know, so we're not-for-profit, we're CIC, we're about looking after um, and nurturing the local area and the farming, you know, so there's so many connections that kind of helped us come to that, those decisions at the very beginning. So, um, you know, even if I look back, 15 years ago the you know the application forms and whatever it was was still talking about you know what will you be serving your product from how will you be doing this how will it we you know we were asking those questions maybe before it was kind of really crucial so I think for us it was it's slightly different to other things and I, I think you're right it, you know you you can create these beautiful events and have so many ideas and but does somebody ask about oh how is that lighting going to work and how does that, what is the impact of doing that? Um, so I think there's so many points where actually you can make a big difference within events, um, but they might be very small things to start with and, and sustain, but you know, the fact that uh, there's the other side of, you know, events hire lots of equipment. So they're not buying new things, they're not creating, you know, we use a lot of hire companies. Um, so you're hiring in infrastructure, but there's obviously a knock on to that because you have to transport those to site and it, it's constant. And I, but I think you can educate yourself to try and make the decisions that are right for you as an individual event. Um, and, you know, the same as you're saying, you can encourage people, but they're still, you know, once you're at an, at a venue, those people are kind of paying for the venue and then they will look and say, well, yeah, but I want such and such. Um, and you might never be able to change their mind on that. Thanks, Jess. That's really interesting. I know we have touched on recycling. We said sort of it's, it's only one facet of it. But I wonder, Jess, I know you've done a lot of work around recycling and waste and how you manage the waste from, from your event. And I just wonder if you wanted to touch a little bit on that, because I know you, you've got some sort of interesting learnings about how to actually try and get people to navigate actually recycling stuff, which is always easier than it sounds. Yeah, I think it is really interesting. Um, and especially as a festival, you understand that there can be a lot of waste. Um, and especially as a food festival, I think that in general for festivals, the food, the takeaway food side of it creates lots of waste, you know, whether that's a music festival or a food and drink festival. Um, so we have done a lot of research over the years around this and tried lots of different ideas. And um, for many, many years, people used to say to us, why aren't you recycling? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And we were, but we were doing it in such a way that um, it probably wasn't so obvious. So we were collecting all of our waste and we still to this day do the same version. So we collect all of our waste. It all goes into the same place. It all gets sent off and it all gets sorted. Um, and the reason that we do it that way is because the research that we found is that for us, that has the, big, the best outcome. So that way we recycle the most um, because of the food waste, researching it, that if something goes into the wrong bin, you know, it's not scraped off completely, it's not rinsed out, it's, you know, happens to have whatever it is, it contaminates that whole bin. Um, whereas if we put everything together and it goes on a conveyor belt, so um, we use a company that picks everything, they. I can't even remember how many different kind of cycles it goes through, but everything is basically sorted and picked through. Um, and that has worked best for us. Um, so we try to tell that story through the festival that we are 
recycling our waste, but we are collecting everything and it's sorted um, and recycled individually. And it is always very clear when you speak to people that visually they would much prefer to see separate bins. You know, they would much prefer to see a food waste bin, cardboard bins, um, you know, cans, bottles. And visually that's what we know. And that's what makes the most sense. And that's really, it sends a really clear message. But when we did our research, if we did it that way, we'd actually be sending a lot more to landfill than we would do by collecting everything and sorting it. But for the, for the visitor to see visually, it doesn't put the message across um, as well. So, so it's really interesting, you know, once you start looking into these things, you know, what physically works and then what's represented um, for people to see and, and how they feel about that, I think is interesting. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting and a really useful piece of learning that actually the bit that people expect isn't sometimes isn't perhaps the way it goes. And you mentioned also there about that telling that story and how you put that across and make sure people understand that that's part of the event you're putting on and get bits of that narrative as part of your brand and your story as well. Um, I'd just like to welcome Genevieve um, to our call. As I mentioned earlier, Genevieve is our third speaker. She's been meeting actual real life people in a real life place, which is quite an adventure for her. Um, and I'll hand over to Genevieve to introduce herself and I'll share your slides in a sec, Genevieve, as well. Thank you. Apologies for, for um, joining late. Um, yes, I'm Genevieve Christie. I'm um, director, uh, one of the directors of First Light Festival. Um, we had our inaugural festival um, in Lowestoft uh, on the beach in 2019. Um, the idea of, of First Light uh, was really conceived to try and change the narrative around Lowestoft. It's really a, a place-making festival, um, putting sort of culture at the heart of the regeneration of the town. Um, when we put it on in 2019, um, as the first festival, we, we didn't know at all how many people would come. It's a free access festival, um, multi-arts, and we were absolutely bowled over um, by the number. It was um, police estimates were sort of 30 to 35,000 people. Um, so that was amazing. And uh, a lot of those people were lowest off people, which was really our aim. Um, although people came from quite a long way because the, the sort of, um, USP for First Light is about celebrating um, the most easterly midsummer sunrise in Lowestoft, uh, which is the most easterly place in the country and something that we really sort of promote through through all of our programming as well. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe we should look at a, a slide. Um, thank you, Hayley. This just gives you a little bit of a, a flavour of, of the multi-arts sort of festival, very much about working with um, as many communities as, pros as possible. So you can see in the top left hand corner, that's um, people playing ukuleles, song sheets sort of went out before the festival so that people could join in and participate as much as watching music. Um, but of course, a, a lot of music on the, on the outside stage, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, very sort of broad genre um, because it's kind of in that large canvas um, on the beach like that. Um, people having a bit of fun and, and down on the left was a sculpture that we commissioned um, called, we called him Pakefield Man. We wanted to draw attention to the wonderful um, ancient history of that bit of the coastline. Um, and uh, he was, he became a bit of an icon for the festival. Maybe we'll have the next one. Thank you. Um, yes, this just sort of shows the um, food and drink element. We could program that um, along the promenade. If you know Lower Stoft, you know, it's got a very long sort of linear beach and a very long promenade, two promenades really. Um, and it was quite interesting because it was very hard to get those uh, food and drink suppliers come to be at the festival in 2019. I think they thought nobody would come, who's gonna come to Lowestoft to this new festival. Um, and of course, actually lots of people did and they all sold out and um, we should have had more <laughs> they had to go and get provisions and things, which was interesting, but, you know, great. The economic impact of it was 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 wonderful. Thank you. Um, yes, this is really I, I don't know if you've touched on this already, but this was really thinking about getting getting to our festival. Um, 
Lowestoft is, is lucky because it's on the branch line, not lucky in that often um, at the weekend, the branch line has got works on it <laughs> and there's a, there's a bus service. But um, actually in the bigger picture, um, being able to get there by train is really important and something that, that we will champion and, and have been working with Greater Anglia for that. Um, and of course, cycling as well. Um, you can cycle around Lowestoft uh, and, you know, we've been working with partners um, for sort of alternative um, ways to, to come to us and, and to sort of explore the town when you do come as well. That's what that was really about. Um, this this sort of uh, I think is touching what you're talking about um, waste um, when I just joined. Um, one of our partners is um, CFAS, which is the Marine Research Organization, um, which is in Lowestoft and sort of sits within our festival footprint. And the people on the left actually are from CFAS and, and they were using waste generated uh, from there to, to draw attention to issues about marine waste um, and beach litter. Um, that's a particular sort of issue that we have. And that's lots of our volunteers um, who are a key part of sort of monitoring that and helping look at how we deal with that during the festival. Um, one of them was a vicar, <laughs> he's in the bottom right. Um, and yeah, there's there's uh, somebody with a litter pick there. So that's really what that was just to show that obviously in our uh, festival footprint, it's incredibly important as well. Um, I think that's probably nearly the end. Yes, we have camping, so classic part of a festival. It's wild camping on the beach, um, which is very magical, uh, very low infrastructure actually, but of course can generate quite a lot of waste and things like fires um, that you have to be careful about. And we are planning to expand that for next year. So that's something that we'll be looking at how we deal with very carefully, but it is also a wonderful thing to be able to do. Um, this was just to give you a little flavor of uh, the sort of 24 hour nature of the festival, which goes from noon to noon um, and is marking various points of our timeline. And you can see the sort of fire element on the left. We shot our Pakefield man with burning arrows. He was stuffed with straw and we set him on fire, which marked a lovely, a lovely moment um, when it was sort of dark and the main stage had closed. Um, all of these things, of course, have issues to do with sustainability. And that's how we sort of uh, we have to think about that. Um, I think the next slide was also just thinking about decal and um, and how we how we approach that really so that again it just gives you a flavor of, of what the festival is like with different zones um, throughout so that thank you thank you Haley. thank you so much Jimmy. for absolutely wonderful photos well absolutely beautiful um you there was a, a slide in the middle of that that i've given its lunchtime made me very hungry of wonderful food and drink producers sort of street food style bits which looked absolutely lovely and i wondered whether we could touch on food and drink it's such a big area of a sort of event experience whatever kind of event it is people want to eat drink and be merry as the saying goes so I wonder if any of you've got particular thoughts on what sort of what could people do to change the way they source the food and drink sort of locally sourced produce and things like that but also looking at how it's I suppose how it's catered you know how is it delivered we're talking about sort of single-use plastics and we, we talked earlier about, you know, COVID implementing lots of people bringing back plastic knives and forks. Hopefully that's back on its way out. But those kind of pieces, it's such a big part of an event experience. So I wondered if anyone's got any thoughts on what people could do in that sort of area. Hello. Oh, Abby, hello. Yeah, please hello. Do, do intervene. Yeah. Um, so I work with multiple different events and activities and festivals and so on. Um, I would say two of the greener or greenest um, are Fairy Fair and Real Halloween, which have been running for the last 23 years um, as Fairyland Trust events. So about seven years ago, we went completely plastic free. We were one of the first festivals um, to do that. And that's taking everything out, including glitter. We turned that to coloured sand and did various different things. From the food element and the trader element, um, we start from the top. So we set a very, very clear sustainability policy for what would be acceptable for our traders and what wouldn't. And I have to say, I was really pleasantly surprised when we did that because 
because we had set that precedent, our traders adhered to it. So as an event manager, you have to go out there and be bold and say, actually, this is what we expect from you if you're going to trade at our event that we've put our heart and soul into. Um, and we're really lucky now, very, very lucky that, you know, all of our traders understand that. So it is no plastic at all from them. Everything is biodegradable um, or recyclable, I should say. Um, and I think now it's really positive that you're starting to see that at a lot more events. So I think there are more event managers that are having that, you know, that are standing up and saying, you know, if we're going to make this change, we've got to do it all together. And also the other positive that's happening is, is because they're doing that at some events, they're naturally taking it to all events with them because they don't need two sets of bowls. They don't need two sets of cutlery. They don't need, you know, two different operational styles. They're, they're transport, they're, they're carrying it over with them, which is the way to do it. Absolutely, that's great to hear. Thanks, Abby, that's really interesting. And Jess, you mentioned earlier as well about the people bringing food to your food and drink festival and actually how they transport it and getting them to think about that process as well, how they actually get it to the venue before they give it to anyone or sell it to anyone. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's so many elements about that. So the other side, I'm picking up on, on what Abby was saying, we've actually worked with partners previously as well. So recommended um, packaging companies that offer discounts and things to our suppliers just to encourage that. So we've, you know, done exactly the same and said, this is what we need. You know, we wouldn't, wouldn't expect you to do this, this or this, this is the standard we expect and then worked with companies to encourage that. And, and that might mean that actually what they do is they order, you know, what they need for the whole year, but they can use the discount code that's come via us. So it's kind of an incentive. Um, yeah, and the other thing that we we do is get the businesses to think about how they're so they're selling jam when it normally goes maybe to a deli, it might go in boxes of 12, you know, and they're all boxed up and they're nice and safe and they get delivered that way. So what would normally happen is that would be put on a pallet. So when they would come to a festival, they'd obviously have lots and lots of boxes of 12 that they then unpack to put on their stands. So something we then encourage is to say, okay, think about how you're bringing that to site. Do we really need it packaged in that way? But that goes all the way back to the manufacturing side. You know, so we're trying to reduce the waste and think about that bigger picture to say, well, we don't want all that cardboard, you know, on site at all. So please think about it before you're even here. Um, and what we do actually ask is we, on site, we sort, um, all of the rubbish that's created at the event but we do ask every individual business to take their cardboard away with them and we do that to encourage people to reduce their cardboard um, and actually to really make them think about it so if they don't have to deal with it and they kind of make all the waste and just leave it behind it's really unthought about whereas if they suddenly think all oh, right so you know there's this huge pile of cardboard that we're having to then put back in our vans or whatever it is that they're doing and take it away with them it really makes them think about it um, as well. So it's just kind of small little things, I think similar to what we've talked about, well, you know, some small things make a big difference. Absolutely, and great idea to get them to sort of do their own bit. Because obviously if you do it, like you say, if you do it all for them, it's harder necessarily for people to see some of that chain of where does this stuff actually go? It just magically, you know, the fairies have taken it away. That doesn't, it doesn't work like that, does it? Um, Genevieve, coming back to you, one of the pieces you mentioned, and again, you had those lovely pictures of people cycling along the, the prom and, Transport and travel is such a huge area for sort of net zero carbon footprint across the board for anything. But I wonder whether Genevieve, as an event that happens at a particular point in time, and Jenny, as someone who's a venue that's there all the time, what your approaches are to encouraging people to get to you sustainably and the challenges that that can sometimes have in what is actually, and you touched on it, Genevieve, a very rural county. It's not, the transport links aren't always amazing. So if there's anything particular you've done or any particular challenges perhaps that you've tried to get around as well on that. Yes, uh, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I think there are challenges in our um, county, uh, you know, for, for the sort of outlying um, towns and villages where, where there's a bit of a default kind of um, way of traveling is in a car. Um, and also when people are coming to the beach, they quite often are gonna be bringing quite a lot of stuff with them. But I think that um, there is more and more of an understanding that, you know, there are multiple ways to travel and that you can incorporate that 
in how you approach the event and it becomes part of the event. So I think for us, there's, there's, there's lots of things, you know, to do with messaging. And that's why actually linking up with somebody like Greater Anglia and also the community rail network um, is really important and to try and get that integrated into their comms. And that is that becomes kind of, you know, it, it does become part of your journey to the festival. You're, you're going to get the train. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, organisations like Liftshare, for example, thinking about um, people traveling together, something like a festival, you know, is so communal. So actually trying to encourage that message about, you know, all come together, <laughs> minimize your, your transport is very important. Um, so there is that. And I think within our own town um, sort of context, very much trying to um, encourage people to walk and to cycle. And what, what we are doing with us like within the programming is sort of reinforcing that by actually integrating sort of cycling and, and, and walking and running events. So, you know, we are having a, a, a 5K, we are having a, a peer to peer, you know, lowest off to Southwold, that sort of thing. So that actually the whole essence of the festival is reinforcing that that uh, message so I think um, there are lots of things and I think what's exciting is to think you know that I feel that we're just at the beginning of of all that we can do but I think there is a lot that we can do and we can also learn from you know a huge number of other um, organizations that have that have been doing this for a long time but of course it's always very much to do with the context that you're working in you know if you're in a place like Snape like where Jess has um, been you know that's quite a tricky place to get to, isn't it, Jess? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I think it has its challenges. Um, and so you have to look at all of those things and exactly what Genevieve said, you know, I could probably, I mean, I don't know what it would be, the percentage wise, but that, that weekend that the festival is on, which is always the last one of September, nearly every year, you know, there's rail replacement and you look and just think, oh no, <laughs> because there's nothing you can do. And, I mean, you know, we are in a rural location um, and we are using a venue, but we do things like um, we run a shuttle bus service. So, you know, we can't accommodate everyone. We definitely can't, 4,000 visitors coming to one site, uh, we can't accommodate everyone, but we can try and do small things to, to alleviate some of that pressure. So we run a shuttle service um, between Oldborough and Snape so that people can who are in Oldborough or staying in Oldborough as that's obviously um, probably the closest location area is um, that's possible for them to do you know they can get on the on the rail on the bus sorry I'm slightly distracted I've just had a <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good tip though actually you don't necessarily if, if you can't do the whole piece is there a little bit of the jigsaw you can do is there a little bit of this journey that people can that people can fit and Jenny as a fixed location open all the time sort of venue obviously you have a slightly different challenge of people coming um at all times but is there anything you've done around encouraging sort of sustainable transport again I don't know if you're very easy to get to by it's public a, transport it is a difficult one I mean at Stone Market it is easy to get to by public transport provided you live at the end of some public transport and I think that that's really the critical thing it's like if you're coming from Liverpool Street Stone Market is a super easy place to get to and um, it's quicker to get from Stratford in East London to Stone Market than it is to get to Heath Road from Stratford in East London and I think like we are well connected um but you also have to sort of be a bit realistic about where people are actually coming from and for, for us it's a drive time of an hour's around and and I think you know as, as others have pointed out number one people are often traveling with stuff we have quite a lot of disabled visitors visiting with wheelchairs we have a lot of families visiting with buggies and stuff and all of that sort of um, thing we have quite a lot of group visits um all of all of this does make it quite difficult for people because number one rail travel is prohibitively expensive to a lot of our audience and um, and I think there's a limit to like how kind of preachy we want to be um to our kind of day-to-day -day visitors over that because I think it's enough of a struggle for the kind of um a lot of our kind of core audience to just deal with getting here um at all um, having said that, for some of our events, it's it's really easy for us to promote a sort of strong, um, like, you know, kind of, um, let's say, anti-petrol approach to, to getting to them. I mean, for example, our beer festival, most people walk. 
<laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, and they come by train from Ipswich, they come by train from Bury, they come from um, the way around, and we obviously encourage that by trying to um, make that possible. Um, again, weekend rail networks allowing, because often that is a real undermining factor. Um, we have tried like promotions with Anglia in the past, but we've tended to find that we used to give money off to anybody who came by train. Almost nobody ever took it up. It was a sort of, you know, it, you put these things out, but then if people don't use them, you think, well, it's just, it's kind of virtue signaling, isn't it? Rather than actually being a useful contribution. Um, I mean, I once was involved in a different site to this one, but a kind of transport strategy, which was trying to sort of reduce people's um, uh, dependence on cars, which sort of imagined that 10% of the audience was going to come by horse, which was just totally re unrealistic and in some ways like even more elitist than the approach of kind of you know so I, I think a lot of people are grappling with this but the moment you're talking about something which is like not a one-off event like we couldn't do a sort of shuffle bus type thing um then it's um it's much harder to kind of do that across the whole year but just coming back to the wedding venue I mean that's one of the reasons people book us is because we are walkable and if you're looking for a local um, venue, then that's quite it's quite good for people to have access to something um, like that. And bonfire night, 5000 people, I would say almost all of them turn up on foot because it's a very local event. And that is our audience is a very local audience for an event like bonfire night, because why would you travel for something like that? It's a totally different kettle of fish to something like, you know, or um, and, and therefore it's not really kind of a like for like or fair comparison it seems to me no that's that's really interesting and, and genevieve touched as well and, and you jenny and it's got to suit the people if you're attracting young families coming by train and i've got a three-year-old so the thought of trying to take her on a day out that involved two trains and a bus i we probably wouldn't probably wouldn't bother but you know there are there are different options that's before we go to we've got a few questions in the chat i just wanted to touch on and um we'd mentioned before and genevieve you had a slide saying about decor and abby had mentioned about getting rid of glitter and changing it for colored sand i think and things like that and there are within events where we mentioned earlier jenny they, they can be very throwaway sort of the wedding idea that you want what you want and you, you, you're going to have those things but things like balloons printed materials that actually have it's become much more known in the last few years i think that they have quite a detrimental impact on the environment and i wondered if any of you have either done anything on those or found interesting alternatives have you mentioned colored sand instead of glitter but are there different things that perhaps people have done instead of balloon releases and stuff like that that perhaps have filled some of those gaps um i i could just go in there i mean we we sort of took a decision with first light that we wouldn't we could have had quite a lot of stalls actually or uh, activities being offered, you know, that we, when we looked at them, we thought, hang on, no, this, is, these are all plastic for a start, whether it's wands or, you know, that sort of thing, or balloons. And we just took a decision that no, we wouldn't do that. I think to my shame, one crept in, in 2019, of course, was hugely popular. Um, but in terms of decor and um, things like that, we're really keen to be as sustainable as possible. Um, and so that we make things that have got longevity. So all of our site decor, for example, we'll, re we'll keep reusing that. We've made it of, you know, sort of good quality material um, that we can use each year and then sort of add on to um, and that it's not going to be throwaway. Um, and that's really very much behind all of our thinking to do with that. So I suppose it's a balance, isn't it? But I think the ambition is to to yeah, to try and I suppose to set up, set off with that um, approach, and I think what um, Abby was saying before about sort of setting setting the aspiration and the tone from the top and at the beginning, and then you know trying to carry that through all of your work, and I think that that really has to permeate through all aspects. So it does include decor, and it does include. Um, making a splash you know how are you going to do it you've just got to think about it I mean actually fire is quite an interesting thing and we have conversations about that but then when I've talked to our environmental uh, sort of consultant who we work with um, from a university that, the, that in the great scheme of things was thought to be um, the lesser of many evils you know a very small amount of fire creates an enormous impact 
and doesn't make a, a massive footprint really. So we'll discuss, but <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, just coming up as a bomb fan, I have a similar thought every year, but I mean, you don't want to turn into the Puritans, do you? I mean, there has to be like some element of sort of celebration and disposability and fun to living because we can't tread that lightly on the earth that we don't exist at all. And there's there's got to be sort of some balance. But I mean, we we certainly do reuse a lot, exactly as, as, as Genevieve was saying. So, for example, the beer festival we've been running for 25 years and the same stuff comes out every single year, but we also share it with camera um, and berry. So it gets used in lots of different places and um, it's rough, ready. But it's, you know, it, it's, it's had a long life and it's a very sustainable event, Art Beer Festival. Um, the glasses are all proper glasses, so they will get reused or they get sort of passed on. We don't use plastic for it. It's not a disposable kind of thing. And actually breweries are really good at this stuff, too, because it all comes in, um, you know, in the casks which go back to the breweries. So there are some events which have long been sustainable for an economic um, reason in that in that way. Um, I just thought, you know, I know this is sort of slightly off the question you asked, but it's sort of touching on it in some ways, but and I'm, I'm interested to know whether or not any of the others have this as an issue as well, perhaps particularly Genevieve, but so annually when it comes to bonfire night, our one issue is traders in the town selling people, um, well, you know, neon lights and bits of plastic crap and all of that sort of stuff which they then uh, drop all over the field which is where our um, sheepdog trials take place and our sheep are out there so we have to spend a lot of time trying to kind of you know pick up all of these bits of shattered things um because it's a disposable sort of culture event and how how do you deal with like that i mean we've we've sort of had headaches for years like do we try and ask people do we try and ban them but then that's going to result in lots of crying five-year-olds do you try and um like phase in a ban like warn people one year that you're going to do it and you know do you try and stop the traders i mean how how do you deal with a problem like that Oh, go on, Abby. You seem to know the answer. Say, yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> well, I don't. I've just had experience of it myself. And <laughs> um, I would just say phase it in. And actually, talking to the traders is really important. And if you've got that reason also, is because if you've got wildlife, you know, in your space, you know, that they should understand the reason why you don't want that on your site. Um, and talking to the local authority as well and helping them spread that message for you. But it's, you know, I know what you're saying about, you know, being Puritan, but they're conversations that have got to be had if they're causing you a problem. I think, I mean, they are conversations we've had, but it's very clear that the profit motive is the one that is cared about. And it's also on another piece of private land. So the council is um, powerless to do anything about it. And I think that must be a sort of situation that others are, do face. It's that kind of, they know that they can sell, you know, 500 whirly things that night and they sort of descend and do it. I, th I think um, it's, it's really interesting because the sort of econo economic impact of events, you know, is, is so important to a town or the environment that you're creating the event in. And I think what Abby said about sort of phasing it in is the only approach really that you can have and understanding that the bottom line, like you've just said, Jenny, is what's motivating, you know, traders. But then hopefully over time, one can demonstrate that there are alternative products and that, you know, they can be just as effective and that it's that joined upness, isn't it really, that, you know, everybody else is doing this now and eventually you will do it i mean in i think we have that issue with our food and drink traders as well because there's a balance with um bringing local people in and very much wanting to encourage them to be traders with us uh or to sell things and that i sort of see it as an incremental approach and you sort of you know you have your aspiration but but there is always some sort of uh, caveat that you think okay we'll balance it in this way but your long-term ambition is to you know obviously to sort of wipe wipe it out altogether but it is really difficult isn't it because people do see it as uh, as as the economic bounce really of what's going on um and that's positive in some ways so it's yeah 
it's tricky it's probably a bigger picture than just that as well isn't it so I can think the same thing about when I see all those children's magazines at the supermarket that have all that junk on the front and your children don't want to read the magazine they just want the thing on the front um and, and I think that it's about you know so I try to explain to my daughter yeah you know I get it I understand and it's all great but it's not you know it's just plastic junk and you'll you want to play with it for a day and then you've forgotten but actually it's really not good to have all this stuff and I guess um somewhere down the line the same as you know children teach us about recycling and what should go in what bin that will all kind of come into play it's probably much further down the line and you kind of hope at some point that you know those children will go past there and yes they're great and they're sparkly and they're full of lights and they're unicorns and we'd all want one but maybe they might at some point say yeah but we kind of know that that's you know it's that throwaway junk that you know it isn't good it isn't good for our planet because kids are great at that um learning I think you know they're much better than us and I think some of these things are just historical you know you go to the fireworks and what do you, you have to have a glow in the dark headband and a and you know lots of town councils do all of those things and I think some of that is generational um so it's trying to it's the bigger picture isn't it I think mm. Thanks. Well, that's a great example of a real, a real life challenge. You know, the, like I say, these things are, are, are great ideas, but sometimes just keen to get a couple of bits from the chat before we wrap up so that we can wrap up on time. Abby, he mentioned um, a sustainable event qualification and having taken that and keen to know if anyone else has done it. We've actually got University of Suffolk events and tourism class, I think, listening in, hopefully still. So Jonathan might be able to let you know, but I'm aware they do some uh, I think offer some sort of training in this kind of piece so if Jonathan is listening if not perhaps he can feed in later I know there are various things uh, Mike thank you from the East Anglian Festival Network who've launched a greener future initiative um, and let's put the link in the chat I'll send that out as well with the recording from this later but um, do please have a look at that and you can sign up to reducing your environmental impact that's fantastic thank you very much Mike for sharing um, a couple more tips as well here from Abby, thank you. Offering ticket discounts or donations to charity on behalf of guests who lift chair. Did you mention whether people get a discount for coming on a shuttle or something like that? And encouraging people to bring their own coffee cups and arranging with traders to offer discounts. I've seen that as well, great um, great idea. Mike, you also mentioned the Wild Paths Festival in Norwich with a sustainable apparel brand, No Encore, is going to become the first UK festival to launch an entire merchandise collection for second-hand and vintage garments. Absolutely brilliant idea, thank you. And maybe Jenny can get your uh, your brides to do second-hand wedding dresses eventually. Do it <laughs> in a worth a try. That's absolutely great. There's some brilliant examples in here. Thank you for sharing them. Great question, Fiona. Um, has anyone looked into carbon offsetting? Not necessarily promoting it as a necessarily a long-term uh, sustainable option, but something bigger event companies are using. I wonder whether any of the three of you had any thoughts on whether that's something you'd looked into or whether it's not a route you're going down or something that bigger com companies are doing. Um, should I start on that? Um, no, it, it isn't. I mean, I just, um, we plant trees um, across the museum site. We're about to plant another 250. We usually plant some stuff every single year, but Planting trees is not an answer to all the problems that are out there. I think it's just it's too easy as to sort of push the problem down the road to someone else. It's much more important to look at what you can do across your your whole kind of operation and to try and sort of make that, you know, not, don't monetize the problem and then push it off on someone else. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm coming at this from a sort of slightly different perspective, obviously, in that I'm looking much more at the venue rather than at the events. I mean, the events from, from our point of view are one aspect of the operation of the venue, but much more importantly is the way that we're operating across 40 different buildings and how we're dealing with the animals and the sort of um, the circularity of the way that we run our own operations and energy generation and heat pumps and all of those sort of things. So um, with, with that kind of context, we're certainly looking at how we can um, define our net zero carbon pathway more effectively than how we have done previously. Um, and it's a huge learning journey. Um, and there's loads of things that we get wrong. And I think, you know, there are loads of things that we'll continue to get wrong in a way which is a bit 
frustrating but ultimately I think sometimes you kind of you've got a sort of zigzag until eventually you get to the better version of the organization that you can be that's great thank you got a chance for a couple more comments then we will wrap up at half past because I know everyone's got sort of um busy days to get on with but I don't know if you've or if there's any tips from any of the three of you that we've not covered that you'd like to share I just think on that point, I completely agree with um, Jenny and I can see Fiona's um, comment in the chat as well, that it does feel that it's moving the problem somewhere else to do with offsetting. Although I am interested to see a, a, a long term plan for First Light and then we're working with the University of Essex <clears throat> and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to, to seeing how that can work in, in a sort of bigger picture. But I think I'm really interested in things like how we can have more eco equipment, you know, how we don't have to bring in big generators um, and fuel for our events uh, and how we can try and, you know, do that more sustainably and integrate that into our business plan and things like that. So for me, that feels like the more real way of, you know, uh, addressing that than, than sort of offsetting everything, but, but still interested. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Genevieve. Great, thank you all. Jess, did you want to add in any more? No, I think I'm just going to say the same. I totally agree. Um, kind of handing over the, I think, well, I don't know about the, um, whether it makes people feel better to feel like they might be able to <laughs> offset their carbon footprint. You know, we can travel around the world, but as long as we plant these trees, it's okay. So I think that it's about having that real knowledge um, to make the decisions. And I think that Genevieve is completely right. It's about, uh, if people ask or put the demand out there, then the things that we need will happen. So if if, um, if the general public want those events to be more sustainable and that becomes an important thing, then it'll be much easier for the events industry to do that because the businesses that create all these things that we need for the infrastructure will get the demand um, to, to make those things happen, I think. Absolutely, there's a question that's coming actually in the chat, uh, Jess, to you from Jonathan at the University of Suffolk. How much more proportionately does it cost to get your rubbish manually sorted compared to things like a general rubbish collection? Uh, I don't actually think it does. I think when you break it down, um, it doesn't, but it just depends how you do it. So, you know, we use a local company, that's what they do. They'll happily invite you. So, you know, we use Sackers, that's the company that we use. It's um, based in a kind of Woodbridge Bay, aren't they? Runsborough. Um, they'll let you go and see their line. You can see them pick, you can see them pack, you can see where it gets sent off to. Um, and that was kind of the bigger thing. I think lots of the time you think it's going to be more expensive, but actually, you know, once you think about having individual bins for all of these things, we can collect the whole lot together. It all goes in one place. And actually, I think something that um, maybe Jenny talked about is actually people that's the, you know, having people to do those things is the bit that takes the time, that takes the money. Um, so we looked at loads of different ways and the guys over at Sackers, if this isn't an advert for them in any sort of way, but they are great, you know, and the way that they do things and the way that they deal with it, um, very hands-on local family business. And I feel like those things are really important to sustainability as well, you know, using local suppliers. Um, is really important and that actually gives you a lot of strength to your events as well. So the more local businesses you use, it's not just more sustainable, but it's um, sustainable in a supportive way. You know, those companies buy in and they support your event as well as um, being local. Yeah, it creates a, certainly creates a more resilient supply chain as well if you're using local. Thank you all. We'll wrap up because we're keen to finish on time. So I know you've all got busy afternoons ahead. Thank you so much, Genevieve, Jenny and Jess for joining us. And thank you all for your great questions and input. We have um, more events coming up in this programme. A few of you have already joined some. They're all linked on our website. We have recorded this session, so I will send it out later today, the link to the recording and the link to some online tools as well that will hopefully be useful. If you have any questions that you didn't have a chance to ask or that suddenly pop in your head, do send them. You've all got my details to the event right anyway. Feel free to send them through. Um, and I can pass them on to um, to our speakers as well. But thank you all for joining um, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. Have a lovely afternoon. And you. Bye bye.